share with you all. Thank you so much for being here, for being adaptive. I know you've got a lot of things that are front of mind as you think about preparing for the ed TPA. And I can tell you as somebody who has worked with that particular assessment, that while it's important that you're thinking about, I wonder what models I'm gonna incorporate and I'm wondering how I'm gonna to put together my curriculum, the difference between those who do really well and those that are doing okay will be what you learn about today in frameworks like this. Uh, my name is Dr. Ebony Kane. I'm the chair of the EDD program. That's the pr practitioner doctorate here at Pepperdine. And I'm really thrilled that you have the opportunity to hear from one of my favorite people, but also an incredible intellectual, um, Dr. Peter Ellerton, who does this work with educators across the world. Um, we are really lucky to have him with us today. Um, he is working with teachers and uh, educators at Simon Fraser in, in uh, Canada and was able to stop down to talk to all of us today. Um, so please, as you listen and he shares with you some of uh, the work that he's been doing, please come with questions. Think about how this relates to the work that you are doing and want to do. So without further ado, I'm going to ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Peter Ellis. Thanks very much, Abby. Much appreciated. And thanks, guys, for coming along today to a uh, little talk. Um, Yes, much much to say. Firstly, thanks thanks for the invitation. Thanks to be here. I am just popping in on the way to, to Simon Fraser, a stone's throw away. Um, and it just seems so from Australia anyway. It's like a fifteen hour flight. Um, but here here, here we are. Um, and um, to talk today about well that that topic um, and I suppose about critical thinking in general. Um, so let me tell you something about my own background, first off, as we, we go through here. So um, I began my, my professional career as, as a teacher. Um, I was a high school teacher in um, physics and maths, mostly. My master's was in physics. Um, and I got a keen interest in how we teach people to think well and what that even means. Um, the other subject I used to teach was philosophy and I was always struck by how my philosophy students changed their thinking and that thinking stayed changed. There was something different about them. And what was it about the sort of methodology of philosophy that was so interesting? Um, so I went to the university with that project in mind to understanding critical thinking. Um, and if you want to know how we think, then you can learn a lot from cognitive science and psychology and such. But if you want to know how we ought to think, not what we ought to think, but what makes for good reason and how we even understand that project, that's a philosophical project and a very ancient one. So I did my PhD in philosophy, which was focused on critical thinking and teaching. And um, it's from that work that we have established at the University of Queensland, our critical thinking project. And our, our main focus, we do a number of things, but our main focus is working with educators. So we have, we have um, teacher networks, educator networks, um, uh, nationally and, and internationally, um, made up of teachers from all areas, from primary to tertiary, and from every, every subject area you can think of. Um, and our uniting goal is what does it mean to teach people to think well? So we spend all our time in that space. And funnily enough, we do a lot of corporate work, you know, with with, with um, um, police and fire and emergency leaders, with um, <laughs> with town planners, with military intelligence. It's all because everybody seems to appreciate that we need to be able to think well, wherever we are and whatever we do. So... That's all well and good, but as I said, the key project is how do you teach people to do that? Because that's the challenge. There's a different skill set to being able to do it and being able to teach people to do it. So I could I could just talk about that for, for days and days, and in fact I do. And and Dr. Kane has been present when I've talked for days at times at workshops where we do this. 
And that just scratches the surface in itself. So what can we do here today in the short time we have together? Well, um, this is this is something about testing the credibility of claims. Okay, it's a, it's it's a hook, if you like, into critical thinking. Um, and what I'm not going to do today is give you the solution that solves all the problems. Um, if you like, I'll just wait wait a minute for those who thought that I was going to. If you have something better to do for the next hour or so, you can you can slink out. Um, good. All right. <laughs> So, um, but I would like to just talk about a couple of ideas that are important in critical thinking. Now, this, this doesn't necessarily focus um, solely on the educational aspect, but I think you will see the relevance of it to what we do. So, um, so having said that, let me, let me take advantage of the short time we have now and, and jump sort of straight into this. And we're going to talk about some, some pretty sophisticated concepts. I think, I think many of you will have, will have heard some of this. Um, I don't know who might have heard all of it, but um, we will be uh, uh, just testing the waters, if you like, you know, um, seeding potential discussion in this area. And it's all we can do in the time we have available, but that's okay, um, because critical thinking is a very, very large thing to talk about. All right. So what can we talk about today? Well, today we're going to talk about things like framing of information, Facts versus opinion, the role of our prior beliefs, argument analysis, conspiracy theories. It all sounds a bit technical, but it's kind of fun. Um, and it will, I hope, open us up to ways of approaching things, generate interesting questions that we can use to engage our students um, as we, we talk about this and to better understand ourselves as well. So, um, to begin... Um, well, let, let me ask you that question first off. What is critical thinking? And let me pause for a moment. Um, for, for those of you online, you might like to just reflect a little bit to yourself. Um, those here in the room, would you like to just share with someone next to you what critical thinking is for about 60 seconds? All right, that'll do us. It was, I don't mean to be comprehensive in that very short time. But that really is just a, an exercise to get you to think about what your first reaction is and what other people might say is their first reaction. So my, I don't really want to synthesize all of that right now, just to rather give you the experience of saying, oh, what is it? How do I phrase it? And look, if everybody had just turned to their neighbor and spoken immediately, I would have been gobsmacked because that never happens. Because the concept of what critical thinking is, is very slippery as it turns out. Um, there's lots of ways that you can perhaps say aspects of it that are satisfying, but to really capture it is very difficult. I mean, what exactly is it? Is it, is it a skill set? Certain set of skills that we have? But what skills? Indeed, the interesting question is what is a skill in itself? And how do we understand sort of categories of skill? So is it a skill set? Do we just sort of teach people these skills? Is it a sort of clutch of dispositions and tendencies and habits and whatever else? Um, is it a range of character traits that people have, virtues, even things like open-mindedness and, and so on? Um, is it a kind of thinking or a mode of thinking? And people who talk about kinds of thinking and modes of thinking are typically quite vague about this. What is a mode? <laughs> what is a kind? Um, and on it goes. Is it an innate ability? There's a small number of people who seem to think that is the case. Um, in fact, there's a very small number of people who would tell you that it's an innate ability and there's no point teaching it. <clears throat> They're very wrong. But there are a small number of people who do say that in the literature. Um, is there some technical knowledge of critical thinking that we can just learn? The like, Is there content that we can learn to be a critical thinker? Um, is, is it about reasonableness and what does it mean to be a reasonable person? Um, is it a social competence or an individual faculty? It's a very interesting question because if you say of somebody that they are a reasonable person, you're actually making a social commentary about them. You're not making necessarily a kind of individual isolated analysis of their faculty. So there's all these things 
that it might be, and people aren't quite clear. And if we're not clear about that, well, how is it related to things like media literacy and justification of beliefs and standards of good reasoning and facts and opinions and rational persuasion, collective reasoning, let alone concepts like general intelligence and problem solving. It's a lot, okay? So if we don't know that, we won't know that. And there is no agreement on that. So, so what, is, what does it mean? When everybody says it's a good thing to get more critical thinking. But what do we all mean by that? Well, that's just, it's really quite challenging to, to work in that space and to... Uh, to, but, but everyone seems quite convinced that they know what it is um, until they're asked to do it. It's a bit like uh, the old story of the Cheshire cat in Alice in Wonderland. You know, it's, as soon as you start to look at it, it disappears and fades. Um, so there's our, part of our challenge, critical, critical thinking. Um, if you'd like to hang around, I'll tell you what I think it is later. But um, I'm going to sort of unwind that as we go through uh, the work we are going to do today. Oh, and deliberative democracy, of course, very important. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to jump into a whole bunch of ideas about this uh, this concept of analysing claims and evaluating claims and making our judgments about claims. So let me just talk about a number of things first off. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is this concept of framing. A very old and very un well understood idea that things come to us framed, um, not uh, not um, crystal clear, as we might think of them, unbiased. Um, you know, we are not the cool calculating machines that we think we are. We just process this neutral information. And whatever comes out must be the truth because our cognitive mechanisms are, are, are simply... Um, simply great fact processing units and it's not the case we've got to be careful about what we think about with facts and i'll talk about that in a bit too a lot of this work begins with um, george lakoff the cognitive scientist who he made the point he said as, as an old as a raving lefty himself he said liberals have no idea that language is not neutral it is framed and they have the idea that the facts will set you free a lot of people think that we've just got to get the facts out there okay and then it'll be okay but the facts unframed won't set you free. He notes now, I'll take that in context, but his key point is when it comes to public debate, when it comes to the arena of public reasoning, the facts themselves are not enough, which is frustrating and disappointing, but it's a fact. But those facts are not enough. We need more things. Let me give an example of the kind of things that I mean, the kinds of framings that we might have. There's... There's kind of inputs and other something else. The first thing I want to look at is inputs. And, and we know that we can frame via text and audio visual means, by selective representation or misrepresentation, all sorts of ways that we can frame information or that rather information is framed as it comes to us. So how do we get our students to think about that? Well, there's a, as I'll point out later on, there's a couple of standard media literacy approaches, but I'd like to go a bit deeper. Um, than that. So <clears throat> kinds of framing. There's framings like this. Um, I'll, I'll just, this is one of my favourites that I think I will forever use. Um, some years ago now, um, there was a scientist, Peter Black, who was making claims about a, a, a think tank in, in America um, called the, the Heartland uh, Institute. And his claim was that they were adopting a certain policy on climate science, or the wedge policy, as they called it. They said, no, we're not. And he said, yes, you are. He said, no, we're not. So, um, anyway, what he did was he, he impersonated somebody, then to be someone else, so they would send him their document, which they did. And then he released it. And he said, aha, I was right. And some people said, well, that's not really the right thing to do if you're a respected scientist. You shouldn't be misrepresenting yourself like that and so on. But very shortly after that effect, it was quite an interesting thing at the time. These were some of the things that you could click on if you Googled the case. So you look at the first one here. I realise that, well, I don't see this, but I read some. First one says, prominent climate scientist admits to leaking heartland documents. That's what happened. 
or global warming activists admits to stealing half of the documents. So which of those is true? Um, or Peter Gleick admits to stealing. Climate scientist Peter Gleick admits he leaked them. Internal Heartland documents were exposed. That's how much they were. Heartland document retrieval to retrieve the documents. Uh, whistleblower authenticates Heartland document. That's a, that's a cool one. Um, solicited there, Mr. Stealing. So the point is that none of those, none of those headlines are written unframed. Each one of them is meant to present what happened in a particular light. In the language of this frame. And which one are you going to click on? Well, the answer is the one you probably already agree with, but more about that perhaps later. So we know that text, of course, is very important in how we perceive this. So we, we need to get our students reading information with an eye to how else it might be described. And we need to go back to, as much as we can, the source of the event and then say, which of these things do you think describes it or how many ways could you describe it or whatever it might be. Finland has a rather fascinating program where they encourage their students to misrepresent. Okay? Um, they say, how would, you want to, how would you represent this situation if you wanted to get this point of view across? And the students practice the kind of language they would use to represent that in, in this life. It's a very fascinating way of doing it. Very effective way too, I might add. Um, then we have audio-visual. Another one of my favourites here is um, different um, advertisements for joining a police force. If you are in New Zealand, you have this logo here. Do you care enough to be a cop? Which is very cool. Or make your skills police skills. That's to you. Look, everybody's smiling, happy. The dog is smiling. Everyone's happy there. Or you have... A couple of ones locally about police recruitment. Now, what does that say about the nature of the job and who do you want to actually attract to these jobs? It's a really strong and striking contrast in those cases. Okay? So we have that framing effect there about what it is to be a police officer. And um, that's quite fascinating. And in my hotel just down the road here, I'm across the road from the California Highway Patrol, um, and they have that. So I thought, well, that's kind of cool. I would like to work for the California Highway Patrol, please. They look very happy, don't they? That was an interesting one. Um, so, yeah, there's all these ways that you can do it. Um, so there's audiovisual ways to do this. Again, it's old knowledge. This is an interesting one of selective representation. Here's one on the local news media. Um, transgender female runner who beat 14,000 women at London Marathon offers to give medal back. Yep. Okay. Have you heard this one? Yeah, this one. That was, this, was not, this was only a few months ago. Um, so whenever I have my little Kelvin and Hobbs there, it's, it's a reminder to me that I'd like you to have a chat. <laughs> okay. So let me, if, you, if you're online, perhaps you can have a think yourself. Um, if you're here, you might want to have a chat to each other. What do you think are the implications of that statement there? What do you think was intended by the author of that for the readers to infer or think or feel? What kind of things do you think would be intended to be stood up by that? So let me just give you 60 seconds again to have a think and perhaps a chat about that. <clears throat> Okay, so what do you think the the author of that headline intended people to think as a result of that? That it was some sort of like volunteer um, Okay, good, good. Because you've got this opportunity to give medal back, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. Anything else? That is a female action. Okay. Yes. Yes. That the. The person themselves thought it was unfair to do to be in that position. So we have this we have this concept here of saying it doesn't seem fair, does it, that this transgender female runner won a medal and beat all those people, but she offered to give it back because even she thought it was that. It's a very very astute. I think that's that's pretty much what was going on. Um, and that, that headline is true. 
and so is this. It's a very different thing, isn't it? Okay, very different thing. Um, indeed, that female runner did beat 14,000 women, but she was beaten by over 6,000. <laughs> and it was the participation medal. In the first case, the implication is that that, that medal was taken from somebody who otherwise would have won it. It's a participation medal. Okay? So there is, in this case, an extraordinarily clear message and intent behind that headline. Um, so, but but both of these things are true. So we've got to really understand this concept here that selective representation isn't about um, isn't about not saying what's the case and saying parts of what's the case, not the whole. And now, when you when you actually explore this sort of philosophy of lying and all that, that you do include the inferences you intend people to make as part of the process, um, but just literally, but they're true. So this is you know selectively representing information without, on the face of it at least, lying. <clears throat> so that's a kind of framing as well. Um, and this misrepresentation, I particularly like this particular one. Um, Marjorie Taylor Greene said a rather interesting one here. Um, when when pressed a little while ago about, about holding certain rather odd beliefs, she said, I was allowed to believe things that weren't true. Okay, now, I was allowed to believe things that weren't true. I mean, that's kind of an abdication of responsibility <laughs> there, isn't it? <laughs> Um, there's many ways of misrepresenting. I could, we could have like an hour on misrepresentation, but I thought that was a kind of interesting novel, novel one. It's not my fault. Someone allowed me to do that. So anyway, all of this is just <laughs> different ways of saying what happened. That can be misrepresenting the situation. Um, the framing. So that's how information comes to us in all these different ways and many more as well. Scratch the surface there all those things. But there's also the kinds of framing that we do ourselves when information comes in. Okay? Because we don't take it in a vacuum. Um, most of the most of the literature in in um, psychology and cognitive science, indeed philosophy, um, really recognizes that we ourselves are very active framers. We're, con we're constructivists when knowledge comes in. We don't just, you know, process knowledge cleanly and clinically, we integrate it with our existing systems and so on, make sense of it that way. Um, so in what ways can we do that? Well, look, again, a thousand different ways, but I thought one thing was an interesting contrast here. I'll keep the context local. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I remember seeing this a little while ago on, on um, our Fox News expose of Alexandra Ocasio, Cortez's representation of the um, the agenda, and these were the points exposed, which again is a text framing, isn't it? Exposed, not just she's saying it all over the place, no, but we exposed it because it was hidden. Otherwise, is the implication. You'll often see that in media accounts where they say, you know, so and so, <clears throat> this station, the ABC, whatever is, can now reveal because we knew it all the time. You know, but now we can reveal to you. Um, other ones who are perhaps a little more honest might say that we have just learned that, you know, that can now reveal is a very funny thing. Anyway, so there we go. So now, I don't know, I mean, I, I come from Australia, so Medicare for all seems quite obvious to me. Um, housing is a human right, seems, seems okay. Federal jobs guaranteed is interesting. Um, Gun control, you don't have gun control. Um, yeah, blah, blah, blah. So it depends where you come from and what you have to do. Um, but then you have Ben Shapiro, the conservative commentator, saying whoever wrote that is a full-scale idiot. There's no way to read that document as a rational person would think. Otherwise, something he fervently and genuinely and sincerely believes, okay? because he looks at that and he says, no, that can't work. These things can't work. It's not 
it won't work. Other people look at it and go, meh. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, that's not how the information was framed. That's how we are processing it and seeing it. There's two very different ways of doing that. So all sorts of things go on in there. So I want to talk a little bit about that process of internal framing. But before I do that, let me sort of go to an old chestnut. I think it's fun. Facts and opinions. All right, over to you. And let me give you a couple of minutes on this one. Okay, and if you online, if you'd like to uh, put something in text, by all means do so. Uh, what's the difference in which is better? Off you go. Okay, so we've got we've got some comments online there. Um, would anyone anyone here like to add to that information? If you can read that, I'm sure you can. So thanks to those online, much appreciated. These are some of the the, the things that people often say about the two. Facts and opinion. Um, um, so how do, how do we understand the distinction between the two? I mean, it it does seem you know you get you get comments like you know is that a fact or is it just your opinion? Sort of sort of seems to belittle the notion of an opinion. Facts seem rock solid. And the, the word that somebody said. Here was uh, Marie uh, saying verifiable, okay, independently verifiable, um, and, and so on and so on. So in lots of ways, I think there's a standard way of people talking about the concept of facts as an opinion. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to ask you to have a look at a at a um, an event that happened. Okay, this is um. <clears throat> Tokyo Olympics. These two fellows um, both cleared 2.37 metres, which is very high, and were unable to clear the 2.39 metres bar, even after three attempts. Um, and they, they then came to discuss the sudden death jump to determine the winner. And the fella on the right said, well, could we share the medal? And they went, all right. And so it was a happy time. For everybody, they said, "Whoa, we got two gold medals! Fantastic!" Okay, so everyone seemed happy. They certainly seemed happy, and it was a great thing. So here's my question to you: um, Why didn't they both, or why shouldn't they both get silver? And do you know that there was no silver awarded, and the next person got bronze? Do you think that's right, or do you think it should have been otherwise? How do you think the medal should be? Why shouldn't they both get silver and both gold? And why shouldn't the, the bronze get silver? What do you reckon? Interesting question, isn't it? Mm. And I'd normally give you some time to talk about that, but we're sort of, just for the sake of time, I'm going to um, jump along a little bit. My, my, my point is this. Um, Everybody knows all the facts about this and everyone agrees on all the facts. But there's still scope for different views, isn't there? Because in this case, the facts alone are insufficient to make a decision about why they should both get gold or both get bronze. There's lots of ways we could argue the case. Some people might say, well, surely if you're a gold medalist, you're the best in the world. These guys aren't the best in the world. Well, they are together, but you're not one person who's best, so they should both get silver. Or maybe you want to say that <coughs> if, you're the, if you're a gold medalist, nobody's better than you, in which case these guys should get gold. But there's no experiment you can run. There's no empirical information that will tell you which of those you ought to do. What we require here is some argumentation and some justification based on something else. Um, it's rational. It's very rational. It has to be rationally persuasive. But this is a situation, interestingly, in which the facts are not enough. They don't themselves speak to what ought to be done. And most of the decisions that we are faced with in life are of that sort. The facts inform us 
Of course they do. Someone mentioned before that facts inform opinions too. The facts inform what we do, but they can't make the decision for us sometimes. In fact, frequently. There are other kinds of problems. And in fact, you know, if I was to challenge you to think about the context in which more information will not of itself allow the argument to be settled, we can we can we can relate to almost any moral issue you care to discuss. Mm -hmm. Where the facts might inform us, but will not be sufficient in themselves. We can't just say, well, what experiment could we run that would tell us the answer? We can't just say, what information do we need to know that will then tell us the answer? Sometimes we can. And I'm, intriguingly, I've just finished a, a, a four-week course, well, actually a three-week, the fourth week is being taken by a colleague, because I'm here now. Uh, but it's probably all the new incoming medical students at the University of Queensland. These are postgraduates. They've done their undergraduate degree there in the clinical years. And one of the things we know is that doctors have to make decisions based on incomplete information because you don't have the time or resources to get complete knowledge. Okay, so the facts alone aren't sufficient. So what's the argument you can make that you can run to do this? So I want you to be a little bit careful about the idea of facts and opinions because opinions can be extraordinarily well justified based on the information we have, but also based on a, a solid argument. Okay? And it, opinions can take us where facts can't. So if you just rely on facts, there will be a whole range of things that you will not be able to act on in your life. So we have to move into the space of reasoned judgment. Uh, and that's an important idea, I think. So there's an article, I'll give you this PowerPoint, there's an article I wrote. Here on, on, uh, facts are not always more important than opinions, and here's why, but that sort of covers that. So I think that's an interesting one to throw into the mix. And as I said, I've got something of a scattergun approach here about different ideas I want to see. And that's one. Okay. So there's framing. There's the idea of, of facts and opinions, how we, we use those words. Be careful. Um, there's a fascinating book written called The Half-Life of Facts, and it points out that particularly in medical contexts, facts were having a half-life of about five years. Something everyone agreed on and suddenly realized wasn't the case. So how do you understand the word fact? It's actually a word I never use myself because I don't find it useful. You know, a fact to say something is a fact is an assertion, but you can't really establish that until you go through and explain the whole process of how you understood that to be the case. In fact, that's where the meat is. Okay? In that process of understanding why it is that we thought it's the case. That's where you have to focus your energies. Just asserting to some someone's a fact is not particularly persuasive. So another thing I want to talk about is this notion of our roles of our prior beliefs in the decision making, what we already think is true. Because I said we're not just cool clinical calculating machines. Okay? The way that we frame things internally and construct meaning is affected by, among many things, our prior beliefs. Let me give you a great example of this from a, a wonderful paper from Stanford University Psychologists, it's called Persever Perseverance of Social Theories, the Role of Explanation and the Persistence of Discredited Information. It's actually a terrible title for a <laughs> I mean, what is it? It's like 5.30 and we're, we're talking like that, seriously? It's awful, isn't it? Um, but let me explain it and you'll see it's actually bang on. Okay, So this is what they did. It's a wonderful paper. Um, it actually goes back to the 80s, but it's seminal and we don't talk about it enough. Um, so they got a bunch of people and divided them into group A and group B in isolation from each other, right? And they said, they said, right -o, um group A, we have discovered that there's a very high correlation between being an effective firefighter and being a high risk factor. Now, we don't know why that's the case, um, but I'm wondering if you might be able to come up with some reasons. Yeah. Give us an explanatory narrative for why that connection exists. Group A did that. And they went to Group B and they said, Group B, we have discovered there's a high correlation between being an effective firefighter and being a low risk factor. Now, we're not quite sure why that's the case, but I wonder if you could come up with some explanation. You see why that's the case, because you can imagine the firefighter bursting in and saving the day as a high risk factor, but also slowed by the book. Hard one knowledge, you know. 
Oh, actually, this is going as well. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, so they did. They wrote, they wrote the stuff. And then they came to the two groups independently again and said, all right, Group A, we made it up. We actually have no idea. And they gave a false reason why they made it up. So do you understand we have no idea if there's any connection? Yes. Group B, we made it up. Do you understand why? Yes. Okay, we get it. That's fine. And then in the clever way that psychologists do, they went on to test the belief of each group. And to a stunning amount, Group A believed there was a high correlation between being an effective firefighter and a high-risk taker and Group B, same, and a low-risk taker. Now look at the title. Again, Perseverance of Social Theories, the theories that these people develop. Okay? The role of explanation in the persistence of discredited information. Okay? The fact that we could create a narrative that made sense to us, why there's a correlation this way or that way, outlived the information that created the narrative. Even once we know it's false, the narrative remains. And this is one of the number one tasks of our politicians, is to create these narratives in our minds. Because even if they are proved wrong or there's doubt cast upon certain bits of information later on, the narrative has inertia. And the narrative can remain. It's a very important idea. So we have these thoughts. These, these We spin a, a tale of the world that makes... Coherence, because if there's one thing that humans value more than truth, it's coherence. We love it when everything just makes sense. And that, in fact, is often an indicator for us of truth, but it ought not to be, because there are many ways to do that. So I want to talk about the very complex idea of Bayesian reasoning. You know it's complex because when I asked chat GPT to do me or Valley to do me an image of Bayesian reasoning it came up with all of that so it must be very complex <laughs> um, but this is how we actually touch it so it's, it is quite complex but you know you can talk about it in a reasonably straightforward way and I think it's a really powerful way of showing us how we help how we make decisions sometimes a model of rational decision making so here's how it goes um, so what is the likelihood of us accepting a new idea or hypothesis given that some event occurs in the world? What does that mean? Well, I'll give you an example in a second. Okay. Um, well, the likelihood of accepting us a new idea given that we see some evidence of it in the world is a function of how much we, how, how much we think that idea might be true initially. Do we already think that that's true? Or do we do we think that it's nonsense? Okay, so this hypothesis, this idea, before we even see anything happen in the world, do we think it might be likely? And then we multiply that by the belief in the strength of the connection between the event and the hypothesis. Now, what 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 in goodness what could that possibly mean? Well, let me give you an example. With my wife and I. <laughs> okay, so let me let me let me say. This. So imagine you said, as far as I know, my wife is, is, is in Australia, in Brisbane right now. If you said, no, your wife is here. Um, she's in the room with us. And I would have a very, and, and, and you might say, and here's a photo of your wife to prove that she's here with us. Now, that was taken in, in the Vatican, so it's not evidence that she's here with us, right? So how likely am I to think that my wife is here given you've given me that photo now first off what's my level of existing belief in the hypothesis that my wife is here it's rock bottom okay there's no belief at all and what is the strength of the connection between the event you giving me that photo and the idea that my wife is here well there's nothing that there's no connection at all okay so am i likely to accept the idea yep, of course not okay i'm thinking no there's no way I, there's no reason to think she's here i actually think she's not and this, there's no connection between you giving me that photo and her being here. None. Okay, so nothing. Nothing happens over here. You chat to give me this. But imagine you said, hang on, and you came up and you took a photo of me right now, okay, and then you turned around and showed me, and my wife was standing behind me. Now, my level of existing belief is still very low, right? But the connection between that event 
And the idea that my wife is here would be incredibly high, wouldn't it? Now, I know there's all sorts of ways you could perhaps fake that, but I'm still thinking, I'd still be going, hang on. <laughs> yeah, that would impact me. Okay, so the connection between the evidence and the idea is really high in that case. And that might be enough to even persuade me that, that my wife is here, given that I've just seen that photo. So we've got these two things operating. So how, how often would a worry think about that? Um, <clears throat> so let's play with some other ideas and some other examples to get this, this concept across. So let's say that we have an event which is sea levels are rising. And the hypothesis, the idea we might have to accept is that the planet is warming. That's just the event that is a link to that. Okay. Well, am I going to believe that the, the planet is warming because sea levels are rising? Well, what is my existing belief the planet is warming? Is it high? Is it low? And then, what's my belief in the connection between warming and sea level rise? If I think, well, there's no other way to get the sea levels to rise except for warming, it's a really strong connection, and I have a really high belief that the planet is already warming, well, I'm, I'm there. I'm on. Okay, But it could be both high, they could be both low. One could be high, one could be low. This could be high, this could be low. It kind of, it kind of echoes Carl Sagan's, the, the cosmologist, the planetologist, um, Carl Sagan's great quote that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Because if you're making an extraordinary claim, what makes it extraordinary is my very low level of belief in the first place. But if you want to change my mind, you need extraordinary evidence really strong connections between the evidence and that happening. So that's Bayesian reason. Okay? The idea that there's two things, at least two things involved here in how you change your mind. What do you already think? Sometimes they call that prior belief. And what's the connection between those two things? Right. Now that's important because our narratives can affect this. They can affect our existing beliefs and a lot of people in the media spend a lot of time developing narratives that help us our existing beliefs so that when some event comes along you either will or you won't be tempted to believe the connection that event is, is about um, so so narratives and the way we already rethink really has a powerful life powerful effect on on our reasoning so the, uh, the important point here is we don't just in isolation take an event, see the facts coolly and cleanly, and then just process it in a really rational way and come out with what must be the right answer. Okay. We're a mess. We're a cognitive quagmire over here. Um, and it depends on all these kinds of things. Another example here is Joe Biden confuses two names, therefore he's in cognitive decline. Okay. Well, you see that. Okay, so the event is he confuses the names and the, the hypothesis is in cognitive decline. So what's your existing belief that Joe Biden is in cognitive decline? Um, and what's your connection in the belief between that confusion and cognitive decline? Um, it's a nice example because, you know, put whoever, whoever, whatever name you want there. Again, we're keeping it local for you, but put whatever name you want there. If you think, if you already think that someone's in cognitive decline and they confuse names, you go, ah. Oh, disastrous. But if you don't think someone's in cognitive decline, they confuse two names, you think nothing of it, do you? Of course, the frequency of it becomes disturbing when you reach a certain age. Yeah. I'm speaking about myself here. But, uh, <laughs> but you see these things in action all the time. So what you can do is really focus on this belief. You, know, you do everything you can to make sure people think this so that whatever evidence they're given, they'll feel more strongly that that, that thing is not more evidence of that. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Many of our, well, especially our in-person audience members are training to be teachers, mm -hmm. K-12. Do you have any suggestion uh, or can you maybe make a connection um, to help our K-12 teachers understand that like this is the type of thing that students, whether they're four years old or 18 years old or adults like us, this is this is the reasoning that's gonna come up in the class. It, it, it's absolutely the reasoning. Because
because what you can do to expose this kind of thing, I don't mean expose it as being wrong, because this is actually quite a rational method in many ways. But what you always want to do, and I say this, I say this time and time again, that critical thinking begins with the giving and taking of reasons. And our conversations are always about what's your reasoning? What's your argument? Why do you think that might be true? What other reasons might exist? Why do you think they're the best reasons to accept that conclusion? Might there be other reasons that we could consider as well? What that process does is mitigate this kind of thinking. Okay, it it makes, in fact, one of the things that I, I would love to talk about for another day, if we had, would be the impact of, of social cognition, the way we think together on mitigating all our individual means of thinking, all the problems and biases that we have in our individual thinking. Social cognition is a wonderful way of doing that. So the culture of the classroom in which we make our thinking explicit by always talking about reasons, by always evaluating our reasoning, is exactly what we need to happen so that we're not just subject to this kind of effect. Okay. So that's that's one of the things that I want to say. That when it comes to evaluative decision making, we know that this is the case. So how do we come to understand people's existing positions? Well, we ask them questions about their thinking. Can you tell me why you think that's the case? Um, and so on. So that's a very good question. Um, and so much of this just comes right back to the necessity in the classroom to focus on making cognition explicit and in that shared culture of uh, that teaching the thinking paradigm. Um, there's even industries that whose job it is to um, focus on these things. So, you know, tobacco industry was a classic example. So of focusing on those two things so that people do not accept this conclusion. Okay, so how are you going to make your students resilient to these kinds of things? Um, it's not just sort of asking a few key questions. It's about really considering the nature of their reasoning. Um, and I say that in you know there's there's several reasons there's several levels of that. It's not just can you give me reasons, but it's particularly important to say why do you think those reasons are the best ones? That's a level we don't often go to in our conversations. Why do you think those reasons are the best ones? You can even go a step further, particularly when you're dealing with very complex issues, is to say, why would those reasons matter to me? I understand why they matter to you, but why would they matter to me? Okay? And that's a different level as well. It, it just, there's reasons all the way down when we come down to this. And it's meaning making, shared meaning making in class that we have to do. Um, you know, of course, one way around this, because we are talking about assessing the, the um, legitimacy and credibility of claims, um, is to actually deny that an event happened at all. You know, those sea levels aren't rising. The earth is not warming, and so on. So before, before we even get to that complexity, we may deny the event. That's a, that's, a, that's a level of operation as well. So that's a, that's a very, as I said, basing reasoning is very complex, a very sophisticated way of understanding it. But it comes down to some of those basic ideas that, you know, we just don't operate in a vacuum cognitively. Um, we process things according to what we already think and, and believe. Um, and it doesn't matter what age you are, that's going to be true for you. So we have to help everybody understand their own thinking as well. It's a really important idea. Um, So that's, you know, there's a lot there about, you know, well, how do individuals do this and so on and so forth. Um, but are there any kind of objective ways that we can analyse a claim that um, kind of makes sense? Um, and I'm going to, again, talk to you like I'm pulling no punches. Um, I'm only here for a short time and I've come a long way. So I'm going to be, you know, do some sophisticated stuff with you. Um, but I want you to see the relationship too, to to the, uh, the context, and I'll explain it very clearly. Um, here's a very ugly diagram. I don't want you to worry about it or process it. Well, that's not ugly. That's quite a nice one. Actually. I was thinking of the next one, which is coming up in a little bit. Um, when you talk about um, media literacy and things, you get some standard questions, like you'll see from commonsense.org. These are good questions. You know, who created this message? Which techniques are used to attract my attention? How might different people interpret this message? 
which values are represented or missing and why is it being sent? So they're good questions. But you know, even even in the in the half hour we've been here or the walk, we've already gone quite a bit deeper into some of those issues. Okay. So I'm just saying this is a way to sort of go through it. Um, but we can go back to arguments now, just talking about getting students to talk about their reasoning. And let's have a look at this. This is the ugly diagram. Uh, again, don't stress about it. Um, but I am going to say that what, what I created with some colleagues was a, um, and one of the colleagues was the climate scientist uh, or the social scientist, John Cook, who was responsible largely for the 97% consensus in climate science paper. May have heard of. But um, this, is, this is an objective way to understand the reasoning we go through. Let me explain, because that diagram won't do it for you. Let me explain. But I will say that this paper has been downloaded over 188,000 times, which for an academic paper is not bad. So it has real resonance when people think, oh, well, you mean we can analyze the reasoning behind a claim and not just the content of it? We don't have to be experts in the area to evaluate whether the claim is okay. That's an important idea, isn't it? How's that for empowering people? Okay, you can actually test the reasoning. It doesn't take much. I'll give you an example. Okay, I'm going to use an important concept here. Here's the concept of validity in arguments. The conclusion is necessarily true given the premises. What does that mean? And who the hell is that? Okay, well, let me take this argument here. If I said to you, all gronks are green, and again, AI's done a great job of making up a gronk for me, um, whatever the hell that is. If I said all gronks are green and Fred is a gronk, you would agree that that conclusion would follow from those two premises. In fact, it must be true. If the premises are true, that conclusion must be true. There's, there's no way to get around that. If you agree that all gronks are green and Fred is a gronk, but don't agree that Fred is green, that's the very definition of being illogical. Okay. And you can prove it using truth tables and Venn diagrams and whatever, but there we have the fact that the conclusion follows from those premises means that the argument is valid. And that's a technical use of the word valid. That's what it means, that we have an argument where the conclusion must follow. Okay? Well, it seems rock solid. Now, just a point here. I don't know those, those premises are true. But if they were true, that conclusion must follow, okay? Well, literally, it's not about truth as such. It's about the logical structure of the argument, all right? So that's a valid argument. No argument about that. Whether it's whether those premises are true, well, it's a very different case, okay? All right, but look at this one. It's valid. Look at this one. All gronks are green. Fred is a gronk, and Fred likes ice cream. Therefore, Fred likes ice cream. Now, there's no way you can get to that conclusion from those premises, is there? But someone might say, oh, but it's true that Fred likes ice cream. And you say, well, maybe it is, but this gives you no reason to believe that. This gives you no reason to accept that conclusion. This is an invalid argument. The conclusion does not follow from the premises. Okay? So this concept of validity is very important. Valid well, doesn't mean it's true, but it's argument structure. Again, that sounds really technical, but why is that important? Well... Have a look at this. Very powerful tool. Very powerful device. Um, but we do care if, if premises are true. It does matter in the real world. But that's where we use a phrase like what we call soundness. If I say all cats are mammals and Fred is a cat, so Fred is a mammal, that is what we call the sound argument. Because it is valid, the conclusion follows, and the premises are true. Okay, That's the best kind of argument you can get, a sound argument. Valid argument, premise is true. Rare as hen's teeth, unfortunately. But you do get it, speaking of hen's teeth. Um, let me give you this example of, a, of an argument. All cats are reptiles. Fred is a cat, so Fred is a reptile. Do you think that argument is valid? Yes, it is. It is. That does follow from those premises, doesn't it? Rock solid. Yeah, if that's true, there's no argument that that follows from the premises. But of course... At least one of the premises is not true. So we say that that argument is unsound, even though it's valid. Okay, so why have I bothered going to that extent and saying all of those things? Well, here's why. Both valid. Um, 
consider the claim below, okay? And I always think I'm going to use a different claim this time, and then I hear someone say it. So I think, no, nope, I'm just going to bring it back in again, okay? So here's the claim that I heard as frequently as, as three weeks ago. It's this. Homosexuality is morally wrong because it's unnatural. Okay? That's the argument that some people make. It's morally wrong because it's unnatural. Now, argument structure. Hidden premises. Existing beliefs. How do we test all of that? Well, let's try and make an argument of it. Because you've got a conclusion there and a reason that somebody has given. Because it's unnatural. Okay? So that's the reason, if you like, that's the premise. Homosexual is unnatural, therefore it's morally wrong. That, that, that's the, the argument structure in that sentence. Are we okay with that? All right, that's its argument structure. Now, let me take it a step further and say, is it valid? You think, well, that doesn't follow from there, does it? What premise would be necessary to make the argument valid? Now, here's, here's the takeaway, okay? What's necessary to make it valid? It's not sound, but valid. What's the answer there? Yeah, you'd have to say that something that is unnatural is morally wrong. That's the only way to make that valid, isn't it? That addition of premise two is an objective fact of the world. There's no way to make that valid unless you have that or very similar language that says the same thing. Okay, this is not a subjective process; it's an objective process. So that when you say when someone says that to you, "Oh, homosexuality is morally wrong because it's unnatural," you say, "Oh, so you think unnatural things are morally wrong?" And I've had people reply to me when I've said that, "Oh, no, I didn't say that." So yes, you did. You absolutely did say that. Okay? You didn't verbalize it, but you have to believe that to get to the conclusion that you suggested. Now, even if in complete ignorance of biology, even if you accepted premise one, it's just as outrageous to accept premise two. What are you going to say, that ballpoint pens are morally wrong? Or brain surgery? Or polyester? Maybe polyester, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe, it is. Maybe it is. But you see what's happening here? You are bringing explicit to the foreground people's assumptions and ideas and thinking by argument analysis, trying to make the argument this way. Okay. So this is why we have to we dig into our students' reasoning all the time. What do you think? Why do you think that follows from that? And then you think, okay, but if you think that, mustn't you also think that? It is. All right. Let's look at what we did in the paper. We didn't do that in the paper. Unsound argument. The planet is not warming because some areas are experiencing record low temperatures. Now, what we did was we look at a whole bunch of, of um, those who disagree with mainstream climate science and their claims. And that's the claim, one of the claims that that's very common. Okay? Now, what we do then is construct an argument from that. We get that. Okay, that's the reason some areas are experiencing a record low temperatures. So, conclusion, no, it's not warming. What's the premise that we need to put in to make the argument valid? In this case, this is a bit trickier. Yeah, take a crack. The, the areas that are, that have low temperatures are not warming. No, I think you're probably you're probably probably rephrasing a premise one in some ways, which I get. But I want to pull it closer, even closer to the conclusion. It's not an easy process. People think this is sometimes trivial, but there's only one thing to put there. But it's hard to find, isn't it? This is a skill that we build over time, mm -hmm. and we only build it by practice, practice, practice through this process. Again, with the time we have, let me let me throw it to you. Okay. If the planet is warming, no area should be getting colder. <laughs> That's the necessary assumption to accept that conclusion. But every model we have, every theoretical construct we have about climate science does not make that claim. In fact, all of them say we're getting more extreme weather both ways. Okay, So once we isolate that hidden premise for validity, we can now analyze the thinking. We go, well, 
That premise is certainly true. First one, but this one isn't. And they say, yeah, well, I didn't say that. No, well, yes, you did. You must think that to get to, it's the only way to get to here. Okay, It's an objective measure for doing it. So again, this is why we always tease out our students' reasoning to see if we can get them to really consider what it is that they're thinking and saying. This is a very sophisticated example and way of doing it, but I wanted to say to you that, you know, this is working in the, in the, the cutting edge area of climate science. This is working with academics who use this a lot, and it's built when you meet your students in early childhood and say, what's your thinking behind that? Sorry, is that a question there? Yeah. Like if someone if you if someone says some areas of experience is record low temperature will be there for the planet's not and you say well it's fact that the planet's what you yeah sure the, yeah the person the person has not made a claim about this they've made a claim about this right so you're saying that this must be the case and they go yes so what's your evidence for thinking that that's true okay you've got to put the onus on that person to justify that premise because they're the ones who have made the argument. And again, we would have a lovely conversation for a couple of hours about the notion of burden of proof and who has the, who has the burden to put a claim. As, as the writer Christopher Hitchens rather beautifully said, um, anything that could be presented without proof can be dismissed without proof. Okay? So if, you say, if they say, oh, no, that's wrong, you say, well, how do you, how do you know? It? Where's your evidence that that's wrong? So they have the, the responsibility to do that. Okay, It's not us to say, well, you must now accept that. It's them to say, Okay, we've now exposed that this must be what in the hidden premises you believe. What's your evidence for it? Yeah. Burden of proof, really important idea in, in critical thinking. And, you know, it's more complex than that, <laughs> but it's all an objective process that that it, it is based on analysis of reason. Okay, um, I might kind of just, I put a lot in this because I wasn't sure how far I would get through. I might... Um, I might um, yeah, have lost everything. <laughs> got three screens going on. Here. Yeah. Cool. Um, I did want to. I'll spend a few minutes on this. How about I do conspiracy theories? Would that be fun? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Conspiracy theories. A conspiracy theory um, is what happens when you get a group of people who are trying to, you know, hide the truth or propagate a falsehood to the general public, okay? and usually for reasons that are not very good. So that's generally what we mean by a conspiracy theory. Now, something quite interesting that's in the literature about this, if you've heard about this, and look, I'm in, I'm in this for a bit of fun tonight too, so I'm just going to show you these things. There is something they call the dark triad, which seems very nasty and evil, but... Um, Three personality traits that um, are characterized by quite malevolent nature and negative impact. Um, narcissism, Machiavellianism, and psychopathy. You can read what they are there. Um, and intriguingly, the research shows um, a disturbing correlation between the development of those three character traits and belief in conspiracy theories. Quite fascinating. Okay? So uh, it is a correlation. And not everybody who has a passing interest in a conspiracy theory you know, is like this. I'm not saying that. But when you get those who are most involved, those who most strongly promote, um, you know, those who truly, if you like, go down the rabbit hole, you do see some of these personality traits um, associated with it. So there's, there's a psychology to conspiracy theories as well. There's some interesting papers on this if you'd like to do this. As I said, I'll give you these PowerPoints so you can follow this up if you like. A um, couple of my favorites. Um, have you heard about the lizard people one? That there's a group of lizards who rule the world and a few people like yeah, Theresa May, the queen, in fact, is, is, uh, is actually a lizard, one of these lizard people. Um, famously, they think Queen Elizabeth because Elizabeth is a lizard birth. And there you go. This is what... <laughs> but it is surprisingly widespread that, that, that there is a race of lizard people who are hiding in the skins of... You know, anyway, they rule the world. I think my personal favourite has to be that birds aren't real. 
Um, bird watching goes both. Have you heard of that one? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the reason that birds always sit on power lines is because they're drones who are recharging. Yeah. Fantastic stuff. There's even one here that says Australia's not real. <laughs> Presumably budgerigars aren't real either, but you know. Um, yeah, it's it's still witch tapestry, isn't it, with, with conspiracy theories. But you know, these are all kind of peripheral, but some of them are disturbingly common, like the flat earth ones. Um, and again, there's an article that I've got here on why would anyone believe the earth is flat, which I'll you can look up and read a bit more if you like on. Um, but I think I think what I really want to get to is this notion of how do you combat conspiracy theories? And there's some very simple ideas, again, based on arguments behind it. And I'll do this, and that'll, that'll do me for tonight. We've got five minutes or so. And we can go to some questions. Um, what we might consider is maybe two general premises. And we might, say, the first premise, premise S, call it, represents what the scientific or other expert community in general thinks is the case, okay? A mainstream kind of view. Okay? It might be that vaccines are good for you, it might be the earth is round. This is the general mainstream thing. The second premise, C, is what conspiracy theorists think is true. Insert your conspiracy here, okay? So, and we know there's a difference between those two, right? So premise S and premise C, scientific community, I, I use scientific because many of the cases are scientifically based, but not all. So, um, okay, that's where we sit. Now, a little word on falsification. How do you falsify an idea? How do you show the idea itself is incorrect in a scientific way? And falsification is generally seen as the definitive way of doing it. A lot of discussion around it, but it goes like this. It's an argument again, okay? If my first premise is if my hypothesis is correct, then under a certain set of conditions, this event should happen. That's what we do, isn't it? We, we hypothesize, we'll set up an experiment and test it. And we say the set of conditions is provided, so we run the experiment, the event did not occur. So what do we conclude? You know, we learn this in the scientific method in primary school. Um, my hypothesis is incorrect, been falsified, I have to move on. Okay, and I didn't get the result that I thought that I would get, so there must be something wrong with my assumptions. Falsification, pretty pretty straightforward. Um, but what if we do the same thing and we confirm my hypothesis? If my hypothesis is correct, then under this set of specific conditions, this event should occur, provide the conditions, the event did occur. Now, have I proved my hypothesis? I think at this point sits a great deal of the public misunderstanding of science. <laughs> My hypothesis is confirmed. It's what we call a confirming instance, but it's not proven. It just hasn't yet been falsified. I can't be sure it's still true. I've got to keep testing in different ways. There's a big difference between falsification, which is definitive, and confirmation, which is all might still be viable. Big difference. Now, why is that important? Well, Let's look at climate change as an example. So premise S, the scientific position is the planet is warming, that humans are contributing to this effect. Premise C, then the position is that scientists are not motivated to increase their funding or support a green ideology or both by making extreme and involuntary predictions about the dire consequences of global warming. And anybody who doesn't agree with that has to accept that because that's a necessary part of, it, of explaining that. And the devilish part is that confirming instances of premise S, planet's warming, okay, they say, oh, here's more evidence, are also confirming instances of premise C. Okay? So the conspiracy theorists have it made because they go, here's another example of this conspiracy in action. And that's how they get away with it. And all conspiracies work the same way. Okay? Well, of course you'd say that. That's exactly what we'd expect to hear from these people who are you know, wrong. So, whenever a result is published supporting that the planet is warming and that humans are in part responsible, that result also supports the idea that scientists are once again feathering their nests by appealing to fear. Each theory is strengthened according to its proponents. So, the scientific community is more confident and the conspiracy theory community is more confident. 
Now, here's the difference. Premis S, the scientific one, could be falsified if we found evidence showing the planet is cooling or that humans are not responsible. We can falsify it, show that it's not the case. But that same evidence would be seen by conspiracy theorists as the truth finally emerging from beneath layers of suppression. There is no way to falsify a conspiracy theorist. This is where it comes down to the thing that I would say to you. When someone says they believe this is the case, there is a conspiracy, you say, what would falsify your belief in that? And I've tried this on several occasions and I've never gotten a good answer. Okay? Because conspiracy theorists are not used to falsifying the idea. And that idea of false, what would it take to falsify it is entirely based on reasoning. Okay? It's an entirely an argument and structure idea. What would falsify it? So if you have a reasoning that okay, birds aren't real, okay, what would falsify your belief? Get them to nail it down. And then when you go, here's one, cut open, there we are. Oh, yeah, but what you'll often find then is that they'll change their position, shift the goalposts if you like. Oh, yeah, but that's not a real one because... Okay, so they maintain the coherence of their beliefs. So you have you have this idea of um, conspiracy theorists cannot be falsified because anything you say to them simply confirms what they already think. Falsification is a is a function of argumentation, which is a function of giving and taking of reasons again. So uh, again, being engaged in that conversation is so critically important. And I am going to go to one more thing. So I think it's very important in the assessing claims and that reasoning and collective reasoning goes to the core of okay. dogmatism mm -hmm. the belief that someone has the truth and that's it okay when you get dogmatic people what is it like here's a fascinating piece of of, of recent well, recent ish was it 2020 paper the fascinating thing about this paper found was Dogmatic people characterized by elite that their worldview reflects an absolute truth, okay, and they won't change. They found the truth, and that's it. And what they found was the more dogmatic participants were more likely to decline helpful additional information, especially when they were uncertain. So the more uncertain they were about something, the less likely they were to seek additional information which is exactly the opposite of what you think a rational person should do, isn't it? Okay? So again, that collective discussion about, can you tell me why you think that? What's your reasoning? How does that work in your mind? And what's going on there? And getting people collectively to be um, involved in a kind of social cognitive web where we each act as testing each other's ideas and evaluating is an extraordinarily powerful way to mitigate all the things that we've been talking about tonight. The culture of your classrooms will be the thing that creates critical thinkers. Okay? That's what you're going to have to be at um, as a focus. Uh, critical thinking is, is actually a values education and a cultural change um, at core. There's a lot of hard intellectual work to be done in that process, but it's not possible unless you have that cultural shift um, where the giving and taking of reasons becomes the norms and the evaluation of reasons which is sometimes what we think of as quite, or no, as teachers, we have to respect all opinions, yeah? No, we don't. <laughs> I think that's a very toxic notion. We should respect everybody's ability to contribute. We should respect every person, but we can't think all ideas are equal because then all ideas are worthless. Okay, but how do you build a culture in which we test each other's ideas? We throw up ideas for thinking. And if we, we work an idea and it doesn't work out, that's not a reflection on the person. In fact, we now know that thanks to that person's contribution. A very powerful shift. So everything I've talked about tonight really comes down to the way that we engage with it, the way that we resolve it, the way that we mitigate it, the way that we optimise the thinking is about collective reasoning. If I had another two days, I would power on with that one. But I think I'll leave it there. But that's enough. So we've got a little bit of time for questions if you want to go down that way too. I know it was a lot, but um, as I said, I'm only here for a short time. Questions. What are you wondering about? I am wondering about just because you all came in here. Uh, just I'm talking about the people in the room for those online. Talking about your um, working on curriculum, right? Working on curriculum plan. What does it look like, right? How would you 
what questions might you ask now to incorporate some of what you just heard into those plans and that work? I know sometimes we need to digest too. Yeah, that's a big one. <laughs> I get to start with you know, sort of, uh, you know, always thinking of the teacher lens. Um, you, t you ended so powerfully with a reminder that critical thinking is part of a classroom culture, that critical thinking is a, is a value. Um, so I'm wondering if you could describe sort of practically what are the characteristics of that type of classroom that I know all of you sitting here right now are trying to create an, a classroom of intellectual discourse, whether they're in pre-K or whether they're in 12th grade, um, because these are values of, of mm -hmm. developing citizens and community members. So what are some of the characteristics? Yeah, it's it's a big ask. You could talk about the characteristics of the thinkers themselves or the classroom itself, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, a, and a, I guess a critical thinking classroom um, the, the students are always challenged to question critically and creatively. Mm -hmm. um, they are, are put in challenging situations in which uncertainty is a common factor of it, uh, and doubt, a genuine doubt. Um, they're presented with problems that facts alone can't solve, um, that they think collaboratively is very important, um, that assumptions are challenged, and drawn out hidden premises like we talked about. Okay, what are what what are the hidden premises before? They're the sort of characteristics of the classroom. The kind of cultural changes you see that are characteristics of the critical thinker and the learner. You know, they're the usual things of open mindedness and tolerance and willing willing to inquire and that kind of thing. Um, but I think if you want something more practical, you will see students who don't just offer a view. But as a matter of habit, offer reasons for that view. So when you think, what do you think we should do here? Or what would you think would be the best course of action here? People just don't go, blah. They, get, they take their time. Okay? It's, critical thinking classroom can be a slow classroom. because people are now taking their time because they know that they are not just offering a view, but offering reasons. And that those reasons will be evaluated by their colleagues. And in you know, and and questioned by their colleagues, and it's very supportive and engaged and intellectually strong way. And I, I I must make a point here too that in the culture of the classroom, I said that if all ideas are equal, all ideas are worthless. And I think I think this is true. We must be very careful though that that does not mean that there is one set of ideas that always works in all different contexts. Okay, because meaning and purpose and the, why reasons are meaningful is incredibly context dependent. Okay. And what might be a good reason in this context for doing that is a really bad reason over here. So those reasons can only be really justified by the, the, the community of inquiry that's actually involved in the thinking at the time. They have to be meaningful to those people for the, for the reasons that come from them in their contexts. And that's a very rational approach. It's a very critical thinking approach. But it's not trying to say there's always one way and one set of reasons and one way to do it. This is not the chrome and steel of just logical you know, symbolism. This is actually about meaning making, but then doing something with that and making it persuasive. So that's a long answer to a question. It's a good question, though. Sometimes, perhaps, that might be a point where there is kind of like an indication, well, maybe I told you something, or maybe I teach you this, you know, a reason for something to break that dissonance with what they're doing. That's that's great, and we have we have lots of questions and situations that we pose to students that put them in that position. Exactly. Um, so yeah, and I, everything you said there, you know, you recognise that in your existing imperatives in the classroom to create good thinkers. You know, everything I've said, there's nothing of what I've said here which stands in opposition to any of that. Um, but one of the really th things I wanted to make really clear is that. Um, um, this project of teaching people to think well is something that can begin with adults in their 50s, you know, as it often does for us working with corporate clients. And they've never thought some of these, some of these ideas before. Or it can, it can begin with, you know, early childhood. You can start anywhere with it. Um, but the principles and ideas are unifying, incredibly unifying. 
if we don't start early, there's a lot of mistakes that can be made between then and the time people realise how all this works. So I think it's absolutely vital that even though I've talked about a lot of abstract ideas that that um, that inform a lot of very high level decision making, and it all it all comes down to what people will learn about giving and taking reasons in their very first educational experiences. The better they are at that, the better they are at all of that. Well, best thing we can Daniel do. has a question for yes. you online. He's going to unmute and close it. Oh, thanks, Jenny. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm, a, I'm Samuel Green. I'm calling in from the East Coast and I'm in the Global Leadership and, Ch and Change Program. And my question, uh, you kind of touched on it already with uh, laying out a framework or process for how we can go through this cognitive dissonance. Um, but I was curious, particularly as um, you know, the educator trying to help lead this process within a society or a culture where the voices of the dominant um, are the the most prevalent, and so in a place in a space or setting where you're trying to help lead through an intercultural dynamic, um, how can the educator best navigate that process so that it is inclusive of uh, primarily non-Western traditions and allowing for agency of other voices? That's that's a great question, Samuel. Thank you. Um, we have done a lot of work in Australia with our Indigenous communities. In fact, the reason I'm going to, one of the reasons I'm going to Vancouver is to work um, with Indigenous educators there as well. The thing, the thing that we have found is that you use the word agency, which was really important. Um, <clears throat> very few things give people agency like control over their own thinking um, rather than being told what to think. Um, and we have found in our experience at least if i could if i can be a little bit tangential um, with indigenous students that they are more likely to turn up to schools on days in which the teachers they know are engaging in this kind of pedagogy in the classroom we actually get engagement increases through this um, so the question of being of being inclusive of other views i think is built into the process of meaning making that we do collaboratively. Um, when I I often use the analogy that learning to think well is a bit like learning a language. You you can't do it in isolation. And a big part of both is developing shared meaning. We have to understand each other to understand why something is a reason or could be a reason. Um, without that, if you don't go to that level, then giving someone your reasons is simply another kind of assertion. Okay? So it is meaning making, and I think I think the process of 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 of, in, of um, the community of inquiry, where all voices are heard, is in fact exactly how to give agency to people. Um, in fact, in, in some ways, I'm not sure how else you do it, um, unless you are doing it exclusive of other people, you know, to, trying to go to some space in which it's it's just a certain group of people. Um, <clears throat> so to me, it seems an incredibly important thing that that culture of the classroom is inclusive. But the, the, the real challenge for us all is to be both inclusive <coughs> and evaluative. Because if we're not evaluative, there is no need for critical thinking. Just any idea has equal merit. And is that how we want to progress at all, you know, um, not every context of sharing ideas need be evaluative. Let me say that first off. I totally understand that. There's no reason to just think that must be the case. But occasionally, when we want to move into a critical space, then you know the thing that critical thinkers are most critical of is the quality of their own thinking, and we have to be able to be accountable to each other um, for that. It's not just you must accept my thinking. I'm actually accountable to you for the quality of my thinking. And if it fails on your test, on our collective test, then I have to improve. Um, <clears throat> so I think, you know, I'm going in a lot of directions with this answer, but uh, but I really, it's because I am motivated by the question. I think it's really important that we get inclusive. And we do find inclusivity is not just a goal, but an outcome of that kind of pedagogical approach. Samuel Green says, thank you for your response. Super helpful. 
excellent question, Dennis. Thank you. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Another uh, round of applause. I just also wanted to do a offer a plug um, for the doctoral students who are going to uh, Australia during the summer session. They will have an opportunity to continue this line of uh, thinking. Uh, this is the type of thinking and learning that is not just necessary but required for success. Um, in educational space. And so thank you for um, getting us, uh, sharing this with us and encouraging us to continue this important work. So with that, uh, we would love to say thank you. Uh, if folks would like to connect with you, Dr. Ellerton, do you mind sharing your contact information? I will share my contact information and perhaps if I send the presentation to you, you could share it. I just wanted to have a quick read of uh, Johnson's questions too, for oh, those sure. who want to hang around with. Um, you guys read that? Okay. Um, Jonathan, did you want to unmute and ask a question too? I don't mind okay. if, if okay. John wants to hang around. <laughs> Uh, hi, everybody. Yeah, I, I guess <laughs> I asked it very late, so I'm sorry if I'm taking your guys' time. But um, I loved your presentation. Uh, I'll just basically read what I wrote in the chat. I said, my question is looking at organizational behavior and using critical thinking. Um, as someone who's worked in different organizations within higher education, it feels like management tries to push individuals to be critical thinkers, like to solve problems, to not be micromanaged, et cetera. However, I feel like in higher education, there's a lot of decentralized systems with like subgroups of departments or teams, and we're all kind of competing for resources while trying to maintain that macro sense of goals. And we have this assumption of practice that's considered as like the correct way of doing it, which is, I guess, you know, based on perspectives. So how are we able to navigate these channels as up and coming leaders, especially when power is hard to see? This might be like a, more of a moral question, but I'm curious on your perspective of how do you, how do you combat with not having so much of a, a voice to be able to be a critical thinker to make impactful decisions? Yeah, I, I never get easy questions. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, it's a great question. It's a terrific question, but oh, geez, yeah, it's tough. I mean, the first, it's interesting that phrase you use that management is keen to make individuals critical thinkers, but that's not how you make critical thinkers by, by focusing on individual faculties. Um, a lot of the work that we do, um, and I don't mean to just set up an ideal situation in opposition to the struggles you face, but uh, it, it is is about how how do you structure systems so that they make collaborative thinking the norm in your organisation, um, and, and in fact move away from individualistic thinking. Um, and there's, there's so many fascinating theoretical perspectives on that and so many fascinating practical outcomes. I mean, the assumption that we, that, in, that, that thinking well is an individual faculty rather than a social, or individual sort of facility rather than a social confidence um, is quite a damaging one. Um, it means we set up our educational institutions and our organizational institutions on the assumption that if we can just have, you know, high-performing individuals that they themselves will be able to bring that skill and solve the problems where in fact we need to create systems that that encourage that collective and collaborative thinking because that's how you actually get the best individual thinkers at the same time we're not we're not um, uh, giving up on the goal of developing good individual thinkers this is actually how you do it by going through that collective phase very forgot skin notion I know but but it's it's more than that as well um, so um, one of the things, let me give you one res response to that, which oddly enough comes back to arguments and giving and taking of reasons. I was working with a set of town planners which had a quite a rigid power structure. Uh, this is a council town planners. And I was noticing, and bear in mind I've done this with, um, with military groups as well, where they have a very strong you know, command structure. So how do you actually get people to think collaboratively in that kind of environment. And one of the things that I, I noticed in a particular meeting with the town planners was that someone was very deferential to this, this person called Jill. And I said, well, everyone just, just sort of went along with what Jill said. Oh, yeah, she's been here 20 years. She you know, said, well, um, but how do you know it's the right decision, the best decision? Um, is, is the fact that she's been here 20 years sufficient 
to make the decision. If so, don't bother having meetings. Just do whatever Jill says. Is that what you want? No, that's not what we want. Okay, so what's the next step? So we actually we actually just instituted a very small but interesting change, one we've done in classrooms as well. And I, I mentioned it before, but rather than saying, what's your view or what should we do in this particular circumstances or what's the best path of action, we ask the question and then say, and what's your argument? So we immediately push it into a collaborative cognitive mode of operating. Okay, What's your argument? And I want to... I wanna, Add those few words on the end of almost anything. Okay. All right. So you might say, you know, we're competing for resources. Well, we need this set of resources. What's your argument? You know, so it comes down to, to the simple thing. But the argument is visible. It's making thinking visible. And the argument can only encourage people to engage with that set of reasoning, to test it, to try and improve it. Um, so one very brief response to that in appreciation of what you're trying to say is that we always get people to offer not just a view, but an argument, which is to say a series of reasons that have established why they think that way. And that then makes it open for, that actually gives you something to talk about, you know, and it's, it's, it's thinking is made visible in that process. So normalising that, which you can do quite easily, it's not hard to do that, but normalising that process is, I think, a powerful, method, a powerful step of you know, several possible things. But what's your argument? Which, which is, and, and you know, whenever I say argument, I'm not talking about some combative um, adversarial process. I'm talking about what is your set of reasons that have, and why do those lead to that conclusion? It's a, it's a question we have the right to know when people are trying to enforce policy or make decisions that will affect us. We have the right to know what the reasoning might be. Um, and in a corporate context, I think that's perfectly allowable as well. So that's one answer, considering we're not sitting across the table and, and having a coffee. Uh, <laughs> she can talk for hours on it. Well, uh, I'm stretching anyway. Yeah. And Dr. Ellison, can you do me a favor um, for the benefit of our online folks, just restate her yes, question. Yes, restate the question. Thanks. I guess I probably know your interpretation, but I think as teachers, like we're probably just the most interested about the population so what, how do you like combat a society that's growing more and more like isolated and online and not interested and not practicing critical thinking and mm. educating that future generation of people engaged yeah. with people and I, don't yeah. know, I guess I find it kind of Yeah, okay. So as teachers we have a real interest in critical thinking, but society may not share that interest. And in fact, it may be the case that some in society would rather not engage in critical thinking, in fact, because they're doing quite well, thank you very much, without it. And I always, yeah, it is, you, you can be a bit despondent, get a bit despondent that way. I always say, I don't, I don't worry for critical thinking in the sense that I always think there's someone who'll be talking about it, but I do worry that people won't care about it sometimes. Um, I guess one thing, one thing you can say is that there, there was never a time when everybody wanted to think critically. It's not that unusual. The times we are in are actually not that unusual. Um, and um, I don't know if this will help or not, but I often use the analogy that I don't think I'm going to be... I mean, we will always find as educators that we are a transformative in some people's lives. They will remember something forever. They Something changed that they never went back from because of what we did, hopefully in a positive way. Um, but, you know, in your work in this space of public reasoning, I always use the kind of oil tanker analogy that, you know, an oil tanker is very hard to shift. <laughs> and so you've got one that's heading towards the horizon. And if for a certain period of time I'm pushing against the side of it, by the time it gets to the horizon, it will be a little bit more that way than it was. Sometimes that's what we do. You know, we, 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 are, we are a force for this in society, which doesn't mean to say we will change all of society, but society is in a place that it wouldn't have been otherwise because of what we do. Um, I, and and if, as I get for some individuals, that can be enormously impactful. Um, you know, can either one of us, you know, shift the oil tanker that much? I'm not sure, but um, we're all, if we're all pushing, um, you know, it, it matters. Um, so I think I think 
I don't know. I don't. I don't necessarily do it. I think. I think the project of improving public reasoning is just a very noble one, um, and the best way is through education, uh, and it's it's a job worth doing of itself. What else are you going to do? Okay. Awesome. Well, Dr. Kane is a superwoman, as we all know, always multitasking. Um, so she had to step out because now she's working on interviews. So uh, on behalf of Dr. Kane, the education division and all of GSEP, Dr. Ellerton, thank you um, for bringing your expertise here and sharing it so graciously uh, with our GSEP community and, and um, fielding our questions as well. It, it's been a blessing to hear from you. I've sat here making a lot of noises like, oh, 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 <laughs> um, and just seeing all the applications and the necessity of this from K-12 to hopefully our doctoral students online are really thinking about this as well. Um, so, so thank you for being here. We'll give you another round of applause uh, in appreciation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.